Welcome to the JISC AOC podcast mini-series. I'm Frankie Walker, Senior Public Affairs Officer at JISC. And joining me today, I have Henry Hughes, Chief Technology Officer at JISC. And I also have with me Anthony Bravo, CEO and Principal of Basingstoke College of Technology, Chair of the AOC Digital Reference Group and Vice Chair of UFI. And today we'll be exploring cybersecurity. Now the key theme is leadership challenges with managing cybersecurity in an increasingly hostile threat environment. So my f- first question to you both is, what are the leadership challenges in managing cybersecurity effectively? From my perspective of being in a college, it's really making sure everybody takes it really seriously. Yeah. Like safeguarding, that's yeah. the best mm. analogy I could do. Making sure people don't think it's a joke and people are not afraid to share if they're stuck with something. Like we all get fake emails. We all get those emails. And as some of my colleagues will say that we all know the biggest, the weakest link is the humans. It's not the technology. And so making sure that people are comfortable in sending their email to IT saying, is this real? And I lead the charge on that every week. I send about five from all sorts of people saying, is this really real? Is this edu?" DocuSign, a real document and things like that. So it's about making people understand how important it is. Because if the systems go down in a college of technology, we would be crippled for a period of time. I think that's such an important point. Um, We see continuously where organisations have major incidents, they have incidents they're having to deal with. You can really tell the difference between the organisations that have done the rehearsal, that have clear processes, that have clear leadership, clear policies in place, do the rehearsal. Mm. The recovery time is typically in the 10 day window. Mm. If we go into organisations and they don't have that rehearsal in place, they've not practised, they're not clear, there's not an engaging culture, it's not clear reporting processes, it's much more towards the 20 days of outage. And that's, that's, that's that really devastating. But it's funny you talk about the recovery because I made my people do the recovery. I said, I know you told me it can work, actually do it. And that was, as you say, rehearsal was so, so important. And then on top of that, I'm really old school and old fashioned. And what we do is loads, my staff must hate me for it, but we do so many phishing attacks, fake phishing attacks all the time. And if you get caught, to be honest, you have to come and see me. I have a meeting with you because I explain to you in person, look, you have compromised the yeah. security of this institution. Yeah. How will you feel if because of you filling in a fake Amazon email, the whole college system goes down? And the first time I'm a bit serious, second time I'm really serious, and the occasional third time the person does fear for their job. But mm. I'm responsible overall, so yeah. Yeah. I do have to take that sort of approach. I think that leadership piece is so important that it, everyone can see that it's okay to report it and say, are, are you sure? It's, there's no consequence to checking, but there is a consequence to not checking in that sense. That's so important that to get that. That is so exactly right. Anybody reporting anything, even if it's true, I don't mind. Every, anybody can report every single email. And so long as it's not a mistake, that's fine. We don't mind you make, uh, reporting good things, but if you sign those fake emails and put in your password and compromise the whole institution, that is unforgivable. Yeah. So something that I've picked up that you've both mentioned is that culture, that awareness and yeah. training and the importance of having, having adequate policies and processes in place to ensure that cybersecurity isn't compromised. Yeah. So I guess what would be the tips or the recommendations on how to actually approach recruitment, retainment and also upskill, upskilling of staff when it comes to cybersecurity? Well, for me, there's two angles to that. One angle is the actual technicians, the technical people. And obviously I'm very horrible. I make them do lots and lots of tests before they are actually employed. So I know they are technically competent. And then obviously on an ongoing basis, upskilling, making sure they're up to date with what the latest patches are, what the latest software is and things like that. But I'm not a techie, so I don't understand any of that. I get people like JISC, funny enough, (laughs) to come in and help me to choose the right people. But then for staff, normal like teaching and corporate staff, we make sure on a regular basis they are doing videos or showing them how authentic fake emails can look like and that's 
the main thing we do. We give them fakes, we show them fakes, we warn them about it, and we do this, I wouldn't say every term, but at least twice a year. Mm. And we make sure they've seen what it can be. And you just have to follow by example. And unfortunately, if it's a senior manager, this is something I've noticed, which is really sad, actually. The people who are most likely to fall for it are not the lazy, naughty people. They're the people who are working really hard. They answer the emails in the morning or late at night, and they're just trying to get through all their emails. And I've had some senior people actually fall for it, and it's quite embarrassing talking to them. And I know they're really committed, but at the same time, that commitment has got to go right through and cover the adherence of cybersecurity policies and procedures. I think, I think there's, there's two points there. I think on, on the recruitment of staff in the technical areas, the qualifications, the background checking, the, the tests, however you're, however you're doing that selection is, is crucial. Yep. But as you said, that, again, that, that internal piece of training awareness, showing people what the threat is, yep. showing people how they, uh, people try to compromise them, how good the, the video and the online fakes are, the audio recordings, and how that can be played back through AI and other techniques. Mm -hmm. Just showing them what's possible gives that awareness, gives that context. You, you're absolutely right. And with the old fashioned phishing, where it was just the Amazon or yeah. the whatever, and put your details in. But we know we've been attacked by people being really sophisticated who have gone and found out the name of the HR director yep. or my name, yep. made a fake email account, yep. sent things to HR from my new fake email account. And this is where they're really crafty. They found out as a new HR manager, I think by trawling the job adverts, yep. so they know there's a new HR yep. manager. And the HR manager gets an email from the boss saying, please, couldn't you change my bank details? I woke up one day and I didn't have any money in the bank. <laughs> it was terrifying. So we obviously changed the policy. You have to go in person now if you want to change your bank details in my college. Yep. But that's how clever they're getting now. Yeah. So again, I think, I think the points, you're adapting your processes, yes. you're being transparent about where the threat is, you're talking, you're giving staff tools, support, guidance on mm -hmm. how to do it, there's ways of reporting, and you're bringing that back together. So that's, 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 that really is best practice, I think, in, well, in, in all aspects. So that's, you that's said it better than I can, but that's exactly what we're doing. So we're committed to it, and you have to make sure everybody understands. Like I said at the very beginning, it's as important, if not more important, than safeguarding. It's one of those things, as an educational institution, we have to get right because we will fall over. Every lesson we use technology in, and it would be disastrous. And I know we're under constant, it's when, not if. Yeah, so we've got to be prepared. And we all know the um, impact of cybersecurity breaches can be detrimental to institutions, not only financially, but reputationally. So how can institutions work collaboratively um, to reduce the impact of cybersecurity attacks? Well, I think, I think there's some central GIST services yes. in terms of incident response. Um, so again, the guidance there is report the incident. Exactly the same philosophy that you employ yep. internally. If you see an incident, report it to us. Our incident response teams will go through that. We don't mind the false positives. Please give us all the false positives. We can take those, we'll clean them up. If it is an incident, we work with the organization concerned. We take that learning back. So if there's something that the rest of the sector can learn from, we'll put that guidance out to the community and then everyone benefits from that incident. So I think, I think my takeaway there would be follow the processes. Don't feel bad about over-reporting in that sense in any way. Yeah report what you see in terms of incidents, give it to the incident response teams uh, at JISC, and we can then work with everybody involved to, yeah, to solve those. I was going to say that because we know JISC is monitoring this all the time, and it's a bit like a plumber or an electrician. Somebody's doing something all the time, they're more skilled at it than we are who only get it sometimes. So we keep a close relationship with JISC, and if, God forbid, something happens. We almost had something once, and I, have to, I remember my IT man was pulling out cables. And I was grateful he was on site doing that sort of stuff, but working with JISC and actually cutting it off at the source yeah. is even more secure. Yeah. So we've touched upon roughly, I mean briefly during the conversation about, you know, 
some of the work, Anthony, in terms of leadership, you know, doing those kind of testing and trials with staff, just to make sure that they're under, they're able to identify when a phishing attack is, is happening. And um, what advice would you give to other college leaders who are, you know, looking to stay ahead of cybersecurity challenges? I would be really pragmatic and say, on a regular basis, do the phishing attacks. Employ a company who can make the attacks look very realistic. So they look like they're coming from the HR department, they look like they're coming from the principal, they look like they're coming from IT services. So they look realistic, but as you know, you train people to make sure they look at the email address and hover over it and see what it really is as opposed to what it appears to be. And then, as the principal or CEO of an organisation, you've got to follow it through. If people are breaching those security protocols, you have to make them understand this is, I hate to say a disciplinary offence ultimately, because it will bring your whole organisation down. And it's as bad as having a fire, it's as bad as having a flood. It, as you said, reputationally, it can be really bad when suddenly none of your apprentices can log in, none of your teachers can get onto their dashboard and uh, do things, none of your parents can get in and see what lessons are going on. And even if you can run lessons without IT, I know we'd really struggle. So if you're the boss, you've got to take it seriously. That's the most important thing. Yeah, I, think, I think ownership of that risk and, and recognition that the, the responsibility is with the senior management, the yeah. leadership of the organisation, having that on the regular agenda for yeah. how the organisation deals with it um, and then looking at it. Um, had some really interesting discussions recently with a CFO who had, a, had to deal with a fire in one of their buildings. And he was evacuated, he left his laptop, he just left with everybody else, came out of the building, and they couldn't go back in for an hour and a half until things had been cleared. He said it was that realisation that he was digitally de dependent at that point. Once he could get his laptop, he could go back, work in another building. But that outage just showed, he said, I'm not dependent on the buildings, but I am dependent on the digital systems. And I think that, that realisation is, is important in the leadership context because it's, I can move the people, as long as I've got the digital systems, I can move the people. The buildings aren't, they are important, but they're not critical in the same way from an operational perspective. So, so yeah, I think there's some interesting bits there. I think it's ownership at the top It is there. ownership, and if you're the CEO or the principal of a college, as hard as it is to say it, you should get your governors involved yes, as well absolutely. to yep. actually hold you to account as well even yep. more because when they are then asking you in the governor's meetings what are you doing about cyber security yep. when they ask you about anything you always have to have an answer yep. so it's good to actually prime them to be challenging you about it so as you've made sure you have made your college as safe as possible absolutely yep Something that's been mentioned throughout the conversation is the vital role that GIST plays in, you know, supporting institutions with cyber security. So, Henry, can you tell us more about GIST's forthcoming security centre and its objectives? OK, so I guess it's building on the instant response services that we already run. Um, it, what it will do is it will help organisations, help to protect organisations out of hours. So, you know, <laughs> attackers, unfortunately, it's a 24-7 business. They're working from all parts of the globe. And so what's important for most businesses in the UK education and research is the eight by five, you know, they're, they're working day week. So what the SOC will do is provide a protective cover out of hours. It will then isolate any device that is suspicious. So when the teams come in on a Monday morning, it's a couple of devices that are isolated, which is possibly an inconvenience if it's a false alert. Yeah. But if it's a real one, then the damage has been contained. It doesn't move laterally to a major incident or wider piece, but again, that permission to isolate devices preventatively is so important in the policy and cultural piece, but it will do the out of hours protection essentially, and then allow the team to come in on a Monday morning during normal office hours and go, okay, have we got a problem here or not? You know, do the forensics, do the wipe and replace, get it up and going, get it reissued and, and, and moving on. So, so it's, it's trying to build that protection around organizations and help support them out of hours as well as in hours. And let me just say, I'd much rather have false positives on a Monday morning yes. <laughs> than not have a system yes. on a Monday yes. morning. Yes. So it's definitely, definitely, definitely worth it. And what you haven't said though as well, one of the things just do as well, in my own experience is, one obviously help you in preparing for these cyber attacks, but also if you're trying to recruit a good person to run lead your uh, IT, they can help you with that. 
and also doing reviews on your system to actually check yep. how good your systems are and if there's any weaknesses and things like that. So they have proved quite invaluable to me over my period of time. That's thank you. That's great to hear. I want to say thank you so much, Anthony and Henry, for joining me today. Um, and thank you to our listeners. Um, if you want to find out more about the work that GIST does, register your interest to receive updates and key information to help you plan for our Security Operations Centre. And also you can join GIST cybersecurity community as well if you head to www.gist.ac.uk and click on the section on cybersecurity.